Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. This is part one of our special two-part series with the editor-in-chief of USA Today, Nicole Carroll. Nicole, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, I read your publication daily. Well, Excellent. actually, on Friday, you publish uh, an edition that I have to only read a third of because it's for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We're online all the time. Well, that's, you can I, come to us anytime. Well, that's kind of you. That's kind of you. No, I, uh, I'm still mad that you don't have funnies. You don't have comics in USA Today, but I understand there are space limitations. Again, you can find them online. Okay, well, there you go. Um, you know, one of the things that has fascinated me in, in recent years is, of course, I've always been attracted to USA Today because uh, for a couple reasons. One is that uh, it, it gives me, as a reader anywhere in the country, a national picture uh, of the news and what's mm -hmm. going on. Uh, and that's very helpful. Secondly, historically, the articles have been very short. Mm -hmm. And I have a very short attention span. Mm -hmm. So that's been very helpful. But one of the things I've noticed uh, that, that you're doing is you're having some, uh, you're utilizing some of your partnerships. And I'd like you to actually talk about that first, maybe, to do some very in-depth uh, publication uh, of, of stories and uh, I, tell me a little bit more sure. about that because that's that's the opposite of everything can't carry over to another page philosophy that the newspaper started with. Right. Well, you know, our goals at USA Today are to educate, inform, and empower our, our public. And sometimes you can do that in eight inches and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you need to go a little bit deeper. But even on those long stories, we really try very hard to be clear and understandable. And um, we're experts, but we're not elitist. And I think that's a, a distinction that sets us apart from others. Um, our goal is, again, to educate and empower people and to do that in a very clear and understandable way. Well, and some of the pieces I know you you have, of course, a number of, I, I yeah. assume it's, is it Gannett Partners sure, from, sure. Uh, that uh, have done very sure. extensive uh, research. So sure. I, I've, just, I've just been impressed with that. Yeah, uh, and I can tell you a little bit about that. So... Uh, I've been editor for a little over a year there. When I came in, I had three goals, and one was to um, increase our investigative reporting, to better utilize our network, which is what you're talking about, and to do this in innovative ways to make sure we're reaching new audiences. So at the USA Today Network, we have USA Today plus 109 local properties all around the country and in Guam. Um, I've um, been to Guam. You have been to Guam. <laughs> um, and... Um, so um, we do want to use all those journalists to tell the national stories that you talked about that you appreciate so much. So what's great about that, when we work not only as one network but one newsroom, is that generally wherever news is happening in the country, we can get there quickly or we can be on the scene. So everything from right this very second, we have 20 different journalists on the border um, looking at some of the issues with the detention centers and the, the migration coming through. Uh, when we had the terrible um, mosque shooting near San Diego, we had a reporter base there who could get there. Um, you know, anything that's happening in Oregon with the, um, the, the Republicans leaving the state house over the bill. Um, we, have, we own the, the uh, Statesman Journal in Oregon. We're the state capital. So the good thing about that network is while other news organizations may fly someone in to cover a breaking news event, we're there. We, we live there. And so it's very personal to us. It's not just another story. It's our community. So you've won awards for breaking news and explanatory journalism. How are you using, uh, how else are you using that expertise uh, in terms of your plans for USA Today? Um, yes, you're, you're um, referencing at the Republic. We were a Pulitzer finalist for a breaking news. I was the previous editor of the Arizona Republic, and we were really fortunate last year to win the Pulitzer in explanatory journalism for The Wall. And we're really proud of that because it shows the quality that we can provide to our audiences. And you know what we learned, especially with the wall, we had journalists in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas spend six months covering the wall on both sides, the Mexican side and the American side. And by doing that, again, we could bring an authenticity to that reporting that, that news organizations that sort of just discovered the issue couldn't bring because these are our communities and these are our neighbors. So when you talk about what else can we do, we're doing that with healthcare. We're looking at issues across all 50 states. We're doing that with environmental issues. We're looking at climate change. Imagine if we could look at climate change from 109 different perspectives and how it's impacting our communities. So having that on the ground authenticity truly sets us apart. All right, I'm going to jump into climate change just for okay. a moment. Uh, I, I have one of our uh, top staff members is very critical uh, of, of the U.S. press because uh, his perspective is that we don't cover climate change well. We often ignore some of the top climate scientists. You don't see 
uh, names of people like Michael Oppenheimer from Princeton or James Hansen when he was at NASA and people like that. You don't see them being interviewed very often in the press and that these, th these threats, because they're existential, really aren't getting the coverage that they deserve. Do you think that's a fair criticism or not? You know, I can't speak for all press. I can tell you it's a priority for us. We just created a standalone beat. We have a person whose whole job it is, is to cover solutions to climate change. Not just climate change, but solutions to climate change. In addition, across our 109 properties, all of our environmental reporters come together to discuss how we're going to cover this. Um, we've had local stories. Our Louisiana properties have covered, you know, the changing coastline there. Um, you know, our California properties, the wildfires, we've, we've made direct connections to the climate change issues involved there. So, I can't speak for all press. I can say that we're doing our best, and I think you're going to see more of it. I look at this election. It's finally getting the attention of both the politicians and the electorate. When you look at surveys, it's one of the top three issues that voters say they want to address. So hopefully you'll see a lot more coverage. All right, well, I, 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 I'm interested in seeing that. I'm mm -hmm. curious about that. And I, I wonder if a lot of people in the press aren't really confident that Americans are as interested uh, as they should be, or if the press's role is to maybe get them interested, not as a proactively saying we want you to be interested, but proactively talking about things like methane emissions, or that methane is, you know, 84 times worse as a uh, greenhouse gas than uh, CO2, at least in terms of its initial effect, or that we have, uh, you know, so much methane emissions being released in the natural gas industry that some people say that it's. Uh, uh, greatly affecting, if not wiping out, the benefits of natural gas, which obviously has less emissions than coal and things like that. So you don't see that kind of reporting. So right. Well, I mean, I think you're you're right in that we don't we don't um, we don't join movements. We don't take sides, but we do present the truth. And I think with this issue in particular, it is our job to present the truth, to show the changing coastline, to show, show the impact on wildfires. We're doing a big project right now out of Milwaukee about the demise of dairy farmers, which is linked to climate change. So that absolutely is our job, is to bring the facts to people and let them have those facts to make up their mind. And, but then how about tying that all together? I mean, it's one thing to talk about climate change in relation to the wildfires, mm -hmm. flooding in Florida, or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever, natural, mm -hmm. methane release. Right. But w w where is the effort made, or is there going to be an effort made to tie that all together? Because if you you have fires in California mm -hmm. and you live in Ohio, you know I don't yeah. know if you know yeah. you you know, or if there's flooding in Florida and you live in Texas, right. big deal. Um, I think you're going to be pleased at what you see come out of us. Um, we're working on a project right now that will tie all that together because we have been doing those uh, reporting in pockets, which is very important. But I agree with you. For a national audience, we need to tie it all together. And then we need to let our editorial pages do their thing and advocate. They're separate from the newsroom, but they can certainly advocate for whatever kind of solutions they see. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexile Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political, and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. So in, in terms of you know, looking ahead to the future and the future of, of newspapers and journalism, and, and again, because you have such a national view uh, and are really one of the few. I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, the New York Times sees itself in a national manner. 
so does uh, the Washington Post, but you're really the nation's national newspaper, and, and there's really nothing like USA Today. Given what's happening to newspapers across the country and the just severe difficulties they're having financially, how, how uh, does USA Today survive? USA Today um, is, unlike the New York Times and some of those other ones you spoke about, we don't have a paywall. So in addition to being, and I appreciate what you're saying, the, the paper and the news source for the nation, we do that because we want to make sure that people have access to our information. So for us, it's more of a volume game. So it's really important to us that we have a, a wide audience because that's how we get our money is from advertising, whereas some of these other national players are doing more subscriptions. Um, so at USA Today, we're, we're quite healthy. We have, you know, in our last com score, which is how this has reached, uh, the network had 127 million unique visitors in one month and 1.5 billion page views. So that's very, very healthy. By every measurement, USA Today is a digital first business from our audience to our revenue. Um, I will say on the local side, um, it's, it's important, um, the business model is changing to be more of a consumer revenue model, that we are really asking our consumers in those markets to subscribe for a digital subscription to help pay the cost of the journalism because you just can't get that same volume in a Las Cruces, New Mexico or you know um, some of the smaller communities out there. So it's really important that people who appreciate local journalism and people who want us to do that fact-finding and truth-telling on the local level support local journalism uh, with their subscriptions. So, but isn't that a, a real challenge? Because so many people, so many of us can Google anything we want. Mm -hmm. uh, we're reading stories. We're not necessarily paying attention to the source. Right. Uh, that source often isn't getting paid, though I know th th there are changes with Facebook, Google, and others. Mm -hmm. But are those changes, they're certainly not enough to support journalism at the level uh, that you need in, in other publications with high standards need. What's, right. what's the solution to well, that? Well, there's a couple of things uh, going on there. One is, is you're right. We need to make sure that we're differentiating ourselves so that when people are on a social media or on a search engine, they know it's us. So you'll see in a lot of local markets, you may be able to find it on a Google, but then there, you might have paywall once you get to it. And so um, you'll see more and more of that as tightening the paywalls. And again, it's just so that people understand that the journalism does cost money and we need them to help support it. On the larger issue, it's interesting with Google and Facebook. Um, right now, there's, there's a bill in Congress that has been put up by the News Media Alliance. And I'm not taking a position on that as a journalist, just uh, telling you what is happening. Um, right now, I, there was just a story saying that for the first time this year, digital revenue will um, outpace print revenue on the, on the journalism side. And of that digital revenue, Facebook and Google are taking 60% of it. That doesn't leave a lot for the local publishers who depend on that to support that journalism. So and who are giving Google all the news. The yes, yes exactly. that's... And, you know, in fairness, they're bringing us back audience, but, you know, so many people may never do that click through. They're just reading the headline or to your point, they're seeing it and they're getting their news just from that little square on right. Facebook. And, and they think they're getting their news from Facebook. Exactly. And they're getting it from us. So there is a bill right now to, um, to let the media organizations come together for um, a brief period of time to negotiate collectively with those technology platforms. Right. So essentially to suspend any antitrust yes. concerns. For a small period of time. It's not, not forever, but just enough time to get something moving. So that's interesting to see how that will turn out and to see what support that does or doesn't get. No, that, that would be great. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms, though, when you look at what's happening, uh, in, including to your partners uh, uh, across the country, mm -hmm. I mean, you're seeing newsrooms getting slashed. Um, Certainly the experience that I got to see firsthand uh, in Denver, you had two robust papers, the Rocky Mountain News, the Denver Post. They, uh, the competition was wonderful for any citizen uh, across the state in terms of the extraordinary coverage, the quality of reporting, mm -hmm. uh, and also the price of subscriptions. I mean, they, many of them were getting, or the, both papers were getting just a, an extraordinary amount of advertising revenue because the volume of, sus of right. subscriptions were so high. Uh, of course, when the subscription, one year their annual subscription was $3, so mm -hmm. you know they weren't making money on, mm -hmm. on subscriptions. Rocky Mountain News uh, folded. Well, first there was a joint operating agreement, then it went away. And now the Denver Post is just a shell of its former self where they had a newsroom of you know, 300, 350 people. You're looking at you know, 75 essentially today. Mm -hmm. 
How do, how, what can we do about that at the local level, especially since you're talking about your 109 partners, all of them are facing those kinds of pressures? Absolutely. You know, the most important thing is to support local journalism, to buy that subscription, to buy a gift subscription. You know, I, every holiday I'm getting subscriptions for all my friends and family, like, you're all getting this. So whatever, thing, whatever you can do to support local journalism will support those newsrooms. I mean, certainly some of it has to do in, with the Denver situation with their ownership, which has been very public in the, in the problems that newsroom has brought up. Um, I'm really lucky that the USA Today Network is owned by Gannett that really values quality journalism. And so while we've had to make tough choices, you know, we've really, really tried to keep that quality journalism as, as something uh, forefront. I can tell you something else that, that local communities can do is we're getting a lot of support recently from foundations and a lot of them are locally based. So for example, the Pulliam Foundation, which has um, uh, headquarters both in Phoenix and Indianapolis, gave us a grant to do environmental reporting because that's important to them. There's no strings attached. They have nothing to say about the stories or how we do it. They just want environmental coverage because they know that's important to the community to be educated about that. At USA Today, we have a grant from the Gates Foundation to cover education. Again, no strings, you know, no discussion about what we're covering. They just want more national coverage of education. So. For those people out there who may be part of a foundation or you know, know someone as part of that, that's a really good option too, is help support it through grants for reporting. Well, we have our own uh, effort here at mm -hmm. the Aaron Harbor Show to support journalists. It's called the Publishers Advantage Program, okay. Publishers Advantage Initiative. And what we do is we donate uh, our programs and footage to any newspaper hmm. that wants to you know, take advantage of the fact we may have an interview with Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm -hmm. or we have an extensive interview set of interviews, for example, that no one else has with Robert Mueller. And so uh, we tell certain publications, if you want to, if you're doing a story on Robert Mueller and you want to give your uh, audience a chance to actually see him talk and speak right. because he doesn't talk and speak right. uh, much at all. Here's right. your opportunity. We don't charge uh, for great. any of that. Yeah. Uh, so it's just Thank our, you for doing well, you're welcome. It's just our <laughs> little way of, of trying to support uh, newspapers because one of the things we see in television uh, is that if, if you look at how television news is done, uh, the, the news editor or the assignment editor at the, be you know, right the beginning of the day in the morning, the first thing he or she does uh, to consider what are we going to cover today is open the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they get, those assignment editors can get 50 to 90 percent of their story ideas, right. you know, just, just from a local well, newspaper. It just really comes down to a community valuing local journalism. And frankly, local journalism doing those stories that are important to that community. It's a partnership. So one of our guests who we've had was Craig Newmark. I don't know if you know Craig, who created Craigslist. And, and of course, uh, that just decimated the classified advertising revenue that's so, that was so important and, and so profitable for newspapers. Now, And, and so I'm curious, how does, a, how does a, an industry uh, recover from, from something that's so uh, transformational? Uh, like that. And, and I know, well, USA Today still has classified ads, mm -hmm. though I don't think in your print edition. Uh, well, maybe I see on occasion a little, a few. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, local newspapers, regional newspapers that used to have pages and pages right. of classified ads, pretty much all that is gone, or 90%. Of, I, would, I would guess 90% of the classified ad revenue is gone. And I'm just making up that number, but that would be be my guess. How do you replace something that important? You know, it's really and, and are you mad at Craig? No, no, no. I mean, Craig innovated in that space, and Craig's actually been pretty good to journalism in return. He 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 gives um, quite a bit to journalism and and trying to support local news. Um, you know, he innovated, and that's what we need to do too. And so, yes, that that source of revenue went away, but we've we've uh, adopted it and we've invented new ways of revenue. We're getting uh, much more into the event business where we hadn't before. We do local high school sports awards in in our markets. We do wine and food festivals uh, across our markets. We do storytellers. I don't know if you've heard of the Storytellers Project, that we do live in-person storytelling across our market. So yes, we lost that, but we're constantly looking for new ways to build in revenue that is, um, you know, um, complementary to our mission, which is informing, educating, and empowering our communities. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse, and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. 
You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Safely stop fires around your home. Introducing the Fire Ice XT 20 ounce aerosol canister. Fire Ice XT is an eco-friendly water-based fire suppressant gel. Unlike a traditional fire extinguisher, Fire Ice XT is a highly effective, non-toxic firefighting agent that is easy and safe to use around your home, family, and pets. Available at Amazon.com or call 800-924-4874. Join me and watch the Aaron Harper Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Well, let's talk about the future of journalism. Okay. Uh, right now you have uh, a president in the White House who has uh, named uh, some members of the press and some organizations uh, as enemies of the people. What is your take on that? And uh, I mean, uh, certainly anybody who's been around for a while, anyone who knows presidents, uh, knows that most, if not all, presidents are never happy with the press they get, uh, often are, uh, you know, really don't like members of the press. Uh, but they understand that members of the press have a role to play in our right. democracy. I don't think I've ever seen, and if you have, correct me, but I, I have never seen a president accuse members of the press or press organizations uh, of being enemies of our country, enemies of our people. What, what's your take on that? No, clearly, we haven't seen a president do that before. You know, obviously, we strongly disagree with him. And I think the American public generally disagrees with that. We've gotten a lot of support from people who understand the importance of journalism and under the, understand the importance of us being able to spread the truth. Um, it certainly makes us a little more difficult to do our jobs, um, but we, we're not daunted by it. We're, we're going to do our jobs. We're going to tell the truth. We're going to find the facts. Um, and we are clearly not the enemy of the people. But at the same time, uh, bec I, th I believe because of these attacks, uh, Americans' confidence in uh, journalists and in many uh, um, press publications and, and television networks, et cetera, has gone down uh, in, 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 in a statistically, very statistically significant manner. Uh, so how do we address that, number one? Uh, and, and number two, uh, because of that, I think that has fed into the really the division uh, of the country because people now, of course, and have been now for a number of years, kind of picking and choosing what kind of uh, news source they want, whether it's a MSNBC or a Fox or whatever. Talk, talk about sure. that channel. Um, I think there's a couple of things going on there. I think you know studies have, have showed that that as the media gets more polarized, people are going to the media that agrees with them or that they agree with. Right. Um, by the way, our yeah. friends at, at Google and, and Amazon and everywhere else, Facebook, direct us right. in that way. You get in that algorithm and you get in your little, right, your, your teams. You know, at USA Today, we make a really big effort in all of our local properties to, to, to not go onto one of the two sides, but to really try to give a balanced, fair, accurate report every day. I think it's incumbent on journalists to um, win that trust every day. I think there's a lot of things we can do. I think you have to not rely so much on anonymous sources. I think you have to tell the story behind the story. I think you have to be as transparent as humanly possible when we do a big project. We just did a big project on um, police officers' disciplinary records and how some police officers that are moving from jurisdiction and no one knew about their past, we open that database up to the public. So I don't think it's enough to just say, here's what we found. I think it's really important we say, here's the, the links we went to to verify this. Here's the information we found, and then here, look at the information for yourself. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that, about how do we make sure we're gaining the trust of our readers through whatever project we're doing. Yeah, in terms of that trust, and I'm going to go back to our president again. I mean, he certainly 
uh, uh, exploited the concept of fake news, mm -hmm. uh, which has also, I think, uh, undermined the credibility of the press. How do we, uh, and, and others are using it, whether in the United States or around the globe, mm -hmm. uh, and fake news tends to be news someone doesn't like. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's, it's actually inaccurate. Uh, how, how do we address something like that? I think it's really important that we um, start by, I've got three kids and I talk a lot about media literacy. I know they're spending a lot more time in school talking about media literacy, of really looking at the source, you know, learning about that source, where did they get information, critically reading news reports, um, because anybody can call anything fake news. So it really takes um, a discerning reader now to look at it and, and make up their mind about whether it's trustworthy. And I also, you know, I really encourage people, I think part of it is, uh, is on us on social media when people are passing things around as if they were true without actually reading them. So it takes some responsibility on all of us, um, certainly starting with the media to make sure we are truthfully, credibly, fairly presenting things, but then on the part of the readers to make sure they're demanding that from their news sources and they're not passing along um, fake news. One of the, uh, and, and I, I hope I don't shock you with my admiration <laughs> of the president, but I, I've been impressed with his ability to not just manage but manipulate uh, the press. Uh, the fact that he tweets uh, so frequently and, and to an extent that hardly anyone can keep up with him, which I'm sure is a very intentional strategy. A uh, couple thoughts or questions in, in that regard. Number one, it, it seems that uh, if you look at when the president tweets and with his Twitter followers, maybe a couple million people might see the tweet. Uh, and if he's lucky, a few million more. But when it gets repeated by various websites, by uh, TV stations, TV channels, by newspapers, et cetera, sometimes that tweet, which was maybe seen by a couple million people, ends up being seen by a hundred million people. What responsibility does the press have for that kind of magnification without really addressing the substance of the tweet, especially when in one single tweet, there can be three or four egregiously uh, false statements. Um, I think, first of all, we shouldn't cover every tweet, and we don't um, at USA Today. We, you know, he does make news. You know, when he announces a new cabinet secretary, or you know, when he threatens Iran. I mean, there is news in some of these, and so we will cover those. I think it's really important, though, that we. Um, we get as much as we can both sides in the headline and in the first line of the story. It's not enough to say Trump says this in tweet. We have to say in the headline, Trump says this, comma, critics disagree, or you know, experts have said this is not true because so many people will only read that headline. So if you just say Trump says this, or anybody, it doesn't have to be Trump, anybody says this without giving that comma context, you know, you're spreading the same information that he is on Twitter. And then also, you know, I look at our social media. It's not enough to say the president said this on Twitter. Again, you've got to have that comma attribution in that tweet, in your Facebook post, because some people will never click into the story to get the full context. So it's upon us to do that. So what other obligation do you think the press has in that regard, in that the president can do a tweet in, it used to be 140 characters, mm -hmm. now he gets 280 and mm -hmm. he's not shy about daisy chaining several of those mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but if you have really severely erroneous information and false information, misleading information, or just outright lies in those tweets, what I don't see is any accompanying analysis at the time the tweet is published uh, by, and, and USA Today is actually not the best example, but uh, a, a lot of publications, a lot of TV networks, I don't see that in now saying, you know, this is false and why. This is not true and why. We try to do that as much as humanly possible. We have partners, um, factcheck.org and our 109 properties. It's interesting, one thing we did during the, um, we did it during the State of the Union and also during his Oval Office speech on immigration. We found a way to do real-time fact-checking because we have these 109 properties. We have experts, when he did his State of the Union, we had our folks in New York were ready on economic. We had our border state reporters ready on immigration. We had our healthcare reporters. So as soon as he would say something, we had a list of fact checks ready to go because he says some similar things. So we had an idea of what he was saying. So as he would say it, we would immediately tweet, this is true or this is false and here's the story. We put that tweet up on our live stream of it. So as people were watching it, they could see what he said in, in an instant fact check in real time. So 
you know, we're trying to innovate in how quickly we can do that. But I, I think it's also important that we point out when he says something that's true. You know, I think, you know, it's, we have to be balanced in that way. Sure. Well, I, I, I only wish some of your colleagues in other media organizations would do the same. Well, that's all we have for part one of our special two-part series with Nicole Carroll. I'm Aaron Harbour. Make sure you watch part two, and we'll see you next time. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.